Um, if you have your Bibles there, uh, please open to page three. Tonight, I, I want to look at the deeper things of God. I want to spend a little bit of time on something I don't know if I've ever preached on before. This might be, this might be a first. Page three, which is Genesis chapter two. And the, the thing I want to talk about tonight is something really, really foreign. It's really foreign in our, in our culture to hear about this subject that I'm going to talk about. You don't really hear it on TV. You don't really hear about it really in the news. You don't hear about it in churches. You don't hear about it from pastors. Um, you don't hear about it in sermons hardly at all. And I have to admit, I don't know how much I've really spent on this subject. But I think it's really an important subject because... Um, because your attitude toward the subject that I want to talk about tonight deeply, deeply matters. It matters as far as how it is with you and, and, and God himself and your relationship with God. And the subject that I want to talk about tonight is sin. How is your life in sin? How, how is it with you and, and, and struggling with sin? Or do you struggle with sin? Uh, I think probably the best place to start is what is sin? What is the definition of sin? Because we really don't hear much about sin. We hear, maybe you've heard in, in Romans chapter 3, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Or maybe you've heard in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. Sin is going against God. So God tells us to do something and we do the opposite of it. I think almost all of us, almost all of us are parents here. And so we know we can relate from a parental standpoint in trying to teach our kids uh, to do good things and not bad things. But in much more of a, a greater way is sinfulness in a human being and a God who has never sinned. So when we look at our world and we look at our society, even when we look in the church, and then most importantly, not to look at one another, but to look in the mirror at ourselves. What do you see when you look at yourself? Do you recognize sin? Do you have sin in your life? I can remember um, being accepted to seminary in 2008, 2009. And I was really pursuing my relationship with Jesus. And I was spending a lot of time in the Bible, and I was spending a lot of time in Bible studies. And I was really growing in my faith. And interestingly, when we moved onto campus and as I was growing in my faith, I saw my sin more than I'd ever seen it before. You'd almost think it would almost be the opposite, that as you grow closer to God, that, that you somehow become like a holy man or you, you, you become more pure or more righteous. You, you, we almost kind of think that we put people or pastors on pedestals and we think, well, they're, they're really like a super Christian or, or they're something different. And interestingly, it isn't like that at all. In fact, what we discover is, is that as, uh, as we grow in Christ, we see our sin. We see our sinfulness. We see our need for forgiveness. So how is it with you and sin? Are you casual with your sin? Are you negligent with your sin? Are you approving of your sin or is it is it an acceptable thing that you've just kind of grown accustomed to or is it something that you're that you're struggling with or praying about and asking the lord not only to reveal it to you if you don't recognize it but also to help you with it because the bible says when you come to christ when you come to christ sin will not have dominion over you see before you become a christian you have no choice but to sin. Sin has its, its grasp on you. you, you you're you almost like a hostage to sin. Yes, there are times and moments and obviously in your life that you're, that you're not continually um, pursuing sin. But when the sin comes and kind of tempts you, you have no choice but to go there. And when you come to a, a faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes inside of you and sin no longer has dominion over you. And so as you grow in Christ, you see your sin, but you also see the Savior and the one who is forgiving of your sin. But the reason I want to bring up sin tonight and I want to talk about it a little bit is I think more often than not, we're casual about our sin. 
or we overlook our sin, or we clearly see the sins of other people, but we don't recognize or we fail to see the sin in ourselves. Or we just say, well, I'm about 90% following God, but I still want to have just this little area over here so that, you know, when I want to kind of cut loose and relax, I can kind of go over here and, and, and do whatever I want and be the, the, the master, the captain of my ship. And I heard somebody say one time, don't give God a room in your house. Give him the whole house. And I think that's what Christian maturity is. I think it's, it's uh, asking, surrendering to Jesus and saying, Lord, tear down whatever needs to be torn down in my life and rebuild it so that I can be closer to you. Take away my sin and replace it with your righteousness. Now, what a wonderful subject for us to think about as we enter Holy Week on, on Sunday with Palm Sunday, and then Monday, Thursday is a beautiful service that we have here, and then we don't celebrate Good Friday, or we don't have a Good Friday service here, but, but we recognize Jesus' death on the cross for our sin, that he took sin upon himself, and that he died for our sins, in place of our sin, and rose again from the dead on, on Resurrection Sunday, on Easter Sunday. But what a powerful and important thing for us to consider, our sin. How is it with your life and sin? Do you struggle against sin? Do you wrestle with sin? Do you, are you feeling condemned and overwhelmed in your sin? Are you ignoring your sin? How is it? with you and your sin. In Genesis 2, we see the answers to many questions, but we see sin coming into a perfect world. Genesis chapter 2, on page 3 of your Bibles, starting in verse 15. The Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. Then the Lord said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each one. He gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, and all of the wild animals. But still there was no helper just right for him. Verse 21, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into deep sleep. While the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. At last, the man exclaimed, this one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she has, was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Now the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. Chapter 3, page 4. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it, for if you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful, its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it gave her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it too. And at that moment, their eyes were opened, 
and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. This story is, is so well known in Sunday schools and, and people know this story. But this actually happened. There was a moment in time, just like tonight as you're sitting here at 710 at night on a, on a Wednesday night in Minnesota, in the same way, this was a moment in time that actually happened. God had created man. He had created the world. There was no sin in the world. God saw that man was alone. God created a woman out of man's rib so that man and woman could procreate. God only gave them one command not to do something. And the one thing, people say, well, why is it that God, why did God allow that? Why did God allow them? If he, if he loved the, the man and the woman, why did he allow them to sin? Why didn't he just keep them away from that tree and then they wouldn't sin? Well, that's not love, right? It's not, it, love is not forced. It's not like, you better love me or, or else. So with love comes the option of the other person responding in love in obedience. In this case, the disobedience of going against God, being tempted by the devil, and disobeying God's command is the very definition of sin. God says to do one thing, the devil tempts you to do another thing, and when you do the other thing against what God's will is, that's sin. And we don't make a big deal out of it. I think we rationalize it. I think we justify our sin. I think we, we think, well, I think what we oftentimes do is compare ourselves to someone else that's worse. So, okay, uh, I get drunk at home, but I don't get drunk and drive. Um, well, I cheat and steal a little bit here, but I don't take a gun and go into a bank. Well, I, I look at, you know, some, some people, you know, the opposite sex with lust, but I don't cheat on my spouse. Um, oh, I really love talking about other people uh, when they're not around. Um, but, you know, it's not, it's not a harmful thing. So I think what we do is we justify or rationalize the things that we do against God, comparing ourselves horizontally to other people or to, to the worst of the, the worst. And somehow we, we justify what we're doing um, thinking that, well, we're not so bad because on a comparative basis, we're, we're justifying ourselves. And in fact, in the Christian faith, and actually interestingly, um, Islam, for instance, there's scales at, in paradise and Allah measures and balances out your good and your bad. So, okay, well, here's, here's uh, Jim. And Jim did like, you know, 80% good and 20% bad. So he can come on into uh, paradise. And okay, here's uh, Melissa. And Melissa, you know, she did about you know, 62% uh, good and 48% bad, so she's in. Well, this person did 49% good and 51% bad, so they're, they're not in. I think a lot of people view Christianity that way, that somehow we have to earn our, our way into getting God's approval and our acceptance. When in the reality is, God is 100% holy. He is sinless. Jesus never sinned. God has never sinned. And even if you've sinned once in your life, you can't enter into the presence of a, a, a God who's 100% holy and sinless. Because if you think about it, his purity, his holiness would be infected by your 1% sin, even though you're not 1% sin. You're, you're either 0% sin or 100% sin. See, there isn't a, a grading curve. The, the Catholic Church is a false teaching about mortal and uh, is it mortal and venial. venial or moral sins? Yeah, that's, that's not Bible, okay? So God doesn't say, well, um, let's see. You got drunk last night, but then you went to Mass. So that kind of all works out, okay? It's either sin or it isn't sin. Nothing against the Catholic Church, but that's a false mechanism of justifying how bad your sins are, okay? When the reality is God is holy, you aren't, and in Christ... If you have been born again, he forgives 100% of your sins. He who knew no sin on Good Friday coming up, Jesus, 
took all of your sinfulness and his 100% holiness was credited to your account. There was an exchange made. But interestingly, I'm afraid that we hear that and then we go and do whatever we want. I'm afraid that we don't struggle against sin. Well, I've been forgiven. I'm saved. That's a popular word. I, I'm, are you saved? I'm saved. Okay. So do you struggle against sin? Because sin then has no dominion over you. And the Garden of Eden is so powerful. There's so much explanation as to why we live in the world we live in and why we are the way that we are. See, God created you. And when you were created, originally mankind was created as very good. Man went against God and sin entered the world and all of us are born into sin. We can receive forgiveness if you've accepted the forgiveness that, that is not earned, it's given free as a gift of grace by the Lord Jesus Christ himself to you, then you are forgiven of your sins. And after that, the question I'm asking you tonight for you to think very seriously about is how is your attitude with your sin? And I would suggest it's either one of two things, one of two extremes. One is uh, you're condemned. You don't know if you're going to heaven or not. And you have a, some guilt buried deep within you or in your life or in your past or in your relationships. Or you've done something that is so extremely wrong that you feel condemned and, and you don't have hope. You're hoping that you have hope, but you're not really sure if you have hope. So you can have the condemnation or you could be on the other extreme. You don't really think about sin. And it's really, this isn't, this isn't my, you know, are we, you know, is this over yet? Because let's get on with other things because sin really doesn't apply to me and I really, yeah, it's not, I mean, I know it's a big deal, but so are you rationalizing your sin? And I think that the Christian life is that we pray, and as you read the Bible, the Bible is going to show you your sin. That's why people don't like to read it. The Bible is law, and the Bible is grace. The law shows us our sin and shows us our need for, for forgiveness. The Bible says we should examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith. How do I examine myself to see if I'm in the faith? You reflect on, you reflect on your life, on your relationships. As you read the Bible, the Lord is showing things. He'll bring things to your mind through the power of the Holy Spirit. And then God will give you the grace to reconcile those situations. So you're praying, Lord, show me my sinfulness. Okay, well, you remember the other day when you blew up and, and swore at so-and-so? Oh, well. Did you ask forgiveness from that person? Have you reconciled with that person? Well, that's just my, that's just my temperament. Are you rationalizing that when the Lord brings those things to your mind? Well, you don't understand. I've always struggled with the sin. You, you don't know that, you know, drinking was a big thing in my family. And so, yeah, I'll get drunk a little, you know, now and then. But it's not really that big of a deal. But being drunk is a sin. Gossiping about someone is a sin. One of the greatest uh, struggles for some people is unforgiveness. Well, you don't understand. I mean, I've kind of, I've done my part, but... Uh, I haven't talked to that person. I don't talk to that person anymore. Okay, well, Jesus said that you must forgive and that his forgiveness is contingent upon your forgiving others. So you should be very, very concerned if you don't forgive others or you're harboring a couple of people. There's a couple of people on my list that I'm not... I mean, I'll share this with you. I was in New Jersey in December and talked to my father and had the privilege, the opportunity. It was a rare opportunity to talk to my dad about God. And over a long, several hours in an afternoon, I mean, we started to at least get a little bit into uh, 
uh, Jesus in the gospel. And he said that toward the end of our conversation, there's a couple of people I will never forgive. And I said, Dad, you have to forgive. That's not me. I mean, I said that, but that's not, I mean, that's Bible. That's Jesus. Jesus said, I forgive you. Go forgive others. The disciples said, how many times do I have to forgive my, my neighbor? Seven times? He says, 70 times seven, right? That's 490. If you have anyone in your life that you don't forgive, you are risking your salvation. You may not be forgiven in Christ. Oh, I'm a Christian. I just don't talk to this person anymore because I'm really mad at them and, and I'm done with them. But I've kind of forgiven them. I just never want to see them again. I never want to talk to them. You may have unfinished business to do, to go to them, to call them, to write them, if they're dead, to pray and say, Lord, I forgive them. Give me the capacity to forgive them because I don't have it. That's okay to pray. Lord, give me the capacity to, to not uh, gossip and hate someone. Lord, give me the capacity not to lust after somebody. Lord, give me the capacity not, not to want to get something from someone else that they have because I want it. Lord, give me that capacity because I don't have it. And I think our prayer life can reflect that because the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13, that everything is laid bare before him who you must give an account to. God knows everything that you've done. He knows everything you've said. He knows everything that you've wanted to do, everything that you've thought. Everything is laid bare before him who you will have to give an account to. You can pray honestly to him. You know, I've prayed honestly to God before. God, I don't have an appetite to read the Bible. I wish I did, but I don't. Will you please give me an appetite to read the Bible? And he did. Lord, will you give me more of an appetite to love people? Because I don't. And he did. And this is an ongoing thing for me. It's not like, yes, in, uh, in 2014, I asked for an appetite to read the Bible. And ever since, every waking moment of the day, I've had an appetite. That's not it. And there are things that are so overwhelming in people's lives. Rape and molestation and, 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 and people stealing and people saying horrible, horrible things to you. Or you've said horrible things to them that you don't have the capacity in your own personality or in your own spirit to handle or to do anything about. And that's when you surrender and say, Lord, I've sinned against you. Please help me to, to go to this person in love and in humility and say, please forgive me. I, w I, w I don't know if these things are sticking. I don't know if they're going to stick with you or not, to be honest. I, I hope that they do, and the only reason I hope to is because as your pastor, I, uh, I want you to grow. I want you to, um, I want you to thrive. I want you to flourish. I want you to abound in your love for God more than you ever have in your whole life. I want you to love God and others more deeply. I want you to give up things that you need to give up and grab hold of things you need to grab hold of. And sin is in the way. It's in my way too. I want those walls that are, that are blocking me from being closer to God to fall down. I want the walls in Minnewasha Church that are keeping you from being closer to Jesus to fall down. I want the Lord to just overflow and flood the hearts of the people that come to this church, including you. I want you to do things that are risky and scary to you, but you know that they're the things that God wants you to do, and so you do them. I want to rejoice with those who rejoice, and I want to weep with those who weep. I want to be with you at your hospital bed as you're dying, and us talk about how much we both love Jesus. That's not superficial. It's not covering things up. It's just honest and open and so dependent upon him and his grace. And how vulnerable we are. And how little control we actually have.
and how incredibly gracious and good he is and how much he loves you and how much he loves me and how much he loves the people that you can't stand. What a daring, wonderful way to live. The, the Christian life is so superficial. And bringing the subject to you of sin is something I hope you deeply, deeply think about. Not for my sake. This isn't, well, my pastor said this, so I should go do that. That's not it. It's getting the barriers out of your life that are keeping you from growing and, 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 and loving Jesus more and being close to him. And we have a sign up here some, some Sundays that says, uh, Fruits of the Spirit. Right? It's supposed to say fruit, but it says fruits. <laughs> I didn't know it was fruit until like two years ago, so I'm not blaming anybody. But it says fruit of the Spirit. Remember those? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and self-control. Right? Patience. patience. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. And goodness. and goodness. All those good things. Those aren't virtues. It's not like, oh, that, that guy over there, man, that guy, he sure is patient. Oh, that woman over there, she sure is kind. Oh, that person, they're so self-controlled. It isn't a virtue. It's nothing that you make. It's the fact that you have surrendered and allowed the Holy Spirit to move in you in your relationship with Jesus. And as a result, these things, these attributes of God start sprouting up like flowers, blooming, colorful, beautiful smelling, gracious, things that people will see in you. And they'll see those things in you because it's not you, it's Jesus in you, the hope that you have that will cause the environment that you go into change by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm talking some advanced things here. You don't get to that place without surrender. You don't get to that place without turning away from your sin. You don't get to that place by not being honest when you're praying to God, saying, God, I need help. I can't do this without you. You can't get there without reading your Bible. You can't get there without worshiping the Lord. You can't get there without fellowship with other Christians. So all those little tools and all of those things that all of us need to breathe, I pray will be offered here. And it doesn't matter if there's 10 people here or 10,000 people here. In fact, it's better that there's not 10,000 people here. I don't want to be a pastor of 10,000 because you can't get to, you don't get to know people. You don't get to love people. How do you rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep when you have 5,000 people in your church? Nothing against those, but I think the church has gotten way too big. We're too small. I'd, I'd like to be at a couple hundred or so, honestly, but I don't even care. It's all what pastors, it's all pastors think about. I don't care. Honestly, the thing I care about is the things I'm preaching to you, I'm trying to preach to you, which is sin, forgiveness, love, reconciliation, the, the fruit of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit changing your life, you just being completely sold out to Jesus Christ, and whether you live another 15 minutes or another 15 years, you're all in for Jesus. And, and you can even be honest and say, God, that's not me. But I want it to be me. Use me. I'm open. Forgive me. Renew a right spirit within me. And I'm going to give you a homework assignment tonight. I hated homework. Oh, it's like. <laughs> but I'm going to give you a good homework assignment. And I've read this on my knees in, in, in tears. Psalm 51. Was it Area 51 with the aliens in Arizona? Remember that? Area 51. Okay, so you remember 50. Was there Squad 51 or some TV show like that? Oh, all right, close. Shoot. How many cards in a card deck? 52? So minus one is 51. Okay, Area 51, a deck of cards minus one. How many? 51. Say out loud, 51. 51. Okay. Now, I want you to, for your homework, slowly... Sip. Sip it. Turn off your phone. Find a time when you're awake enough. Pray. Say, God, help me to understand what I'm about to read. And then sip Psalm 51. And what you'll see in Psalm 51 is David, a man after God's own heart, 
uh, commits adultery with Bathsheba, has her husband killed. And finally, when he comes to his senses, he realizes how he sinned against God. And he writes Psalm 51, pouring his heart out to God and asking for God to forgive him. A broken and contrite heart, Lord, you will not despise. Say, Lord, is this me? What areas do you need to change in my life, Lord? Help me to see what areas I need to change and help me to change them. And read Psalm 51 and sip it and ask that the Lord to shed light on that for you and ask him to change you in the areas that you need changing and grow you where you need growth. Let's pray.